This is RCT number 28, The Goal of the Resurrection. RCT stands for the Roman Catechism of Trent. Today we are on pages 73 to 75 of the Hard Book of Tan Publishers. This is the Creed, Article 5, Section D. God give you his peace, in nomine patri sefiri et spiritu santi, amen. O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasure of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. In nomine patri sefiri et spiritu santi, amen. So today's section is the ends, that means the telos, that is the goals of the resurrection. Jesus rose so that we might rise one day in our bodies. We're going to hear also that includes our souls today. This is why we call today the ends or the goals of the resurrection. The Roman Catechism of Trent, also known as the Catechism of Pius V, probably written in part or in whole by St. Robert Bellarmine, reads this today. From what has been said, we can perceive what important advantages the resurrection of Christ the Lord has conferred on the faithful. In the resurrection, we acknowledge God to be immortal, full of glory, the conqueror of death and the devil. In all this, we are firmly to believe and openly to profess of Christ Jesus. Again, the resurrection of Christ affects for us the resurrection of our bodies, not only because it was the efficient cause of this mystery, but also because we all ought to arise after the example of the Lord. For with regard to the resurrection of the body, we have this testimony of the Apostle, by a man came death, and by a man the resurrection of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. In all that God did to accomplish the mystery of our redemption, he made use of the humanity of Christ as an effective instrument. And hence, his resurrection was, as it were, an instrument for the accomplishment of our resurrection. It may also be called the model of ours inasmuch as his resurrection was the most perfect of all. And as his body, rising to immortal glory, was changed so shall our bodies also, before frail and mortal, be restored and clothed with glory and immortality. In the language of the Apostle, we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will reform the body of our lowness, made like to the body of his glory. Philippians 3, 20-21 The same may be said of a soul dead in sin. How the resurrection of Christ is proposed to such a soul as the model of her resurrection, the same Apostle shows in these words, as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, a little further on, he says, Knowing that Christ, rising again from the dead, dieth now no more, death shall no more have dominion over him. For in that he died to sin, he died once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So do you also reckon that you are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus? Romans chapter 6. Me again. You might notice that the soul, in reference to Christ, is referred to in the feminine. And one reason for that is in Latin and all of the Romance languages, the word soul is always in the feminine. So that's not saying women are more in sin than men, since it was talking about rising from the dead and it used the feminine. It's again just because soul is in Catholic literature is almost always referred to in the feminine when we're speaking in generalizations. Now let's talk about this notion of a soul dead in sin, the notion of rising from the dead. Why is there this connection between a soul dead in sin and the resurrection? Well, we know that the resurrection is physical. We're not just talking about spiritual things. The resurrection is physical. But here's the thing. Most of you have never seen a person raised from the dead. I haven't either, except after shocking him or her in my ambulance, I've seen it a few times. That was by natural powers, by uh, intubation and epinephrine and electricity. So that was natural powers, not supernatural powers. But saints, they have raised people from the dead in their bodies, and this was by supernatural power. It was God doing it through the saint, even as recent as Padre Pio, as you know. Now, many in the charismatic movement today say that raising the dead is common even today. I don't know, maybe... I'm certainly not going to limit God, but I didn't see it when I was in the charismatic movement. But here's what I do see many times. When I give absolution, when someone comes to me for confession, I know if that person made a good confession, at the words of abs absolution, especially if they had a mortal sin, that soul is raised back to life. Now, there's 
probably some people are already getting bored because that sounds like a very pious analogy. But here's what I have to say about that. You know, I've been a priest 13 years, and the first half of that I was in parishes often without a divider. So I could see people's faces. And what really and completely surprised me after giving absolution to someone who confessed mortal sin was the difference in the face. I see it even today, even even though I don't have a parish. When I travel around, obviously I have to do that without a screen a lot of the time. And the reason I'm not projecting something psychosomatic in just wanting to see a totally different face after I give someone absolution is that I'm still really shocked. I'm really surprised to see a new face looking at me, a face that truly looks different. The reason I'm surprised proves to me at least, maybe not to you, but it proves to me I wasn't looking for it. It really comes out of nowhere, which is why I think this is God's grace. Now, of course, confession would be just as powerful if I wasn't given that palpable and visual confirmation of me being a priest and and those things, but it certainly is consolation, the fact I get to see this with my own eyes. Now, I'm not exaggerating to sound pious. I truly see a new face after absolution, especially following confession of mortal sins. When this person looks at me, any person, I'm not talking about a single person, I'm talking in general, look at me, and they look different. In fact, I see it in babies' faces right after I baptize them too. It's it's a very light-filled and pronounced difference in the face. Now, I'm not claiming to be a mystic in telling you this stuff, but it does show the power of the sacraments at the hands of even a lukewarm priest like me. And that's why the Roman Catechism of Trent today shows the power that Christ's resurrection already has on souls even before we get to the general judgment. That is that baptism and confession are the two sacraments that raise a soul. And because the soul is the form, literally the form of the body, It's no wonder that a human face, even here on earth, frequently looks different to me after I administer baptism or absolution in the sacrament of penance. The Catechism again, advantages of the resurrection. From the resurrection of Christ, therefore, we should draw two lessons. The one that after we have washed away the stains of sin, we should begin to lead a new life, distinguished by integrity, innocence, holiness, modesty, justice, beneficence, and humility. The other, that we should so persevere in that newness of life as never more, with the divine assistance, to stray from the paths of virtue on which we have once entered. Nor do the words of the apostle prove only that the resurrection is proposed as the model of our resurrection. They also declare that it gives us power to rise again and imparts to us strength and courage to persevere in holiness and righteousness and in the observance of the commandments of God. For as his death not only furnishes us with an example, but also supplies us with strength to die to sin, so also his resurrection invigorates us to attain righteousness, so that thenceforward, serving God in piety and holiness, we may walk in the newness of life to which we have risen. By his resurrection, our Lord accomplished this, especially that we, who before died with him to sin into the world, should rise also with him to a new order and manner of life. Me again. Okay, so keep in mind that one of the requirements of making a good confession is firm resolution of amendment. That means you not only plan on not committing the sins you just confessed, but you have a plan not to to do them again. What's the difference between those two? Well, the first is amorphous and emotional, but the second is a concrete plan with real resolutions not to commit whatever sins you just confessed. And sometimes that includes reparation even beyond the penance the priest gave you like destroying someone's reputation or stealing, even if it's just the beginning of such an attempt, you have to try to make reparation. You gotta try to fix how you harm someone's reputation or how you stole things from people, even if you can't execute a full restoration of someone's reputation or things you have stolen over like 20 or 30 years if you make a lifetime or general confession. Uh, You gotta do like your best. But the most important firm resolution of amendment is going forward to, with a plan not to commit those sins, whatever those sins were. Okay, but what is firm resolution of amendment? Well, that doesn't mean you know for 100.0% sure that you will never commit that sin again. Oh, but wait a minute. If it's not that extreme, but it does include a concrete plan, then what fits between those two bookends? Well, I would say it's the plan to live a new life again with real resolutions. And so I love how the RCT puts it, to, puts it today that after we have washed away the stains of sin, we should begin to lead a new life, 
distinguished by integrity, innocence, holiness, modesty, justice, beneficence, and humility, and that we should so persevere in that newness of life as never more, with the divine assistance, to stray from the paths of virtue on which we have once entered. Okay, and then the Catechism continues, and we'll finish today with this on Christ's resurrection leading to ours. This is signs of the spiritual resurrection. What you're going to hear here is kind of an indication if you're on the right track or not. The principal signs of this resurrection from sin, which should be noted, are taught us by the Apostle. For when he says, If you be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, Colossians 3.1, he, distinct, he distinctly tells us that they who desire to possess life, honor, repose, and riches, there chiefly where Christ dwells, have truly risen with Christ. When he adds, mind the things that are above, not the things that are upon the earth, he gives, as it were, another sign by which we may ascertain if we have truly risen with Christ. As a relish for food usually indicates a healthy state of the body, so with regard to the soul, if a person relishes whatever things are true, whatever modest, whatever just, whatever holy, and experiences within him the sweetness of heavenly things, this we may consider a very strong proof that such a one has risen with Christ Jesus to a new and spiritual life. Thanks to all my benefactors, spiritual and material out there. My only income comes from you, my listeners. You keep this free for everyone who can't donate. I'm especially thankful to those praying for me. That really is more important than the material support due to all the spiritual attack in my life. I remember both groups at my masses. Please say an Our Father for me. Et benedictio Dei Omnipotentis. Patris et Fili et Spiritus Santi descendet super vos et maniat semper. Amen. <laughs>